Thanks for joining us on Power Lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramanian. The headlines at this hour. Market straight flat as market bid remains equally divided. India VIX rises. The regulator said to have initiated a probe into the sharp fall in Indigo share on Friday before the Aditya Ghosh's exit was made public by the company. HL Technology is the top nifty loser right now after the IT company's FY19 guidance, if you exclude the acquisition, fails to meet our estimates. Fortis Healthcare trades with gains of more than 4% after IHH and, the, and Hero Enterprises' Burman family combined hikes their offer once again. And on the show, CBJ Kumar of HCL Tech lays down the company's organic and inorganic growth strategies. KK Mystery tells us how HDFC plans to gain market share in the affordable housing segment. Rising NPA recognition may hurt bank profitability, but Alka and Baraso of Moody's will explain why they think this is credit positive. And Jahangir Aziz of JP Morgan talks about some old and some new pr problems facing the Indian economy. We'll talk about all of that in a moment, but let's first talk about what, where the markets are headed. Neeraj is here as always with a closer look. Yeah, a day of consolidation, Asha, to be honest, uh, except for the fact that the Nifty Bank has performed reasonably okay, despite some heavyweights not doing well, courtesy what's happening, for example, to a stock like Kotak Mahindra Bank mm. or, or HDFC, for example, doing okay. But, I mean, look at, look at the indices and then look at the Nifty Bank and there's a clear uh, demarcation out there because the Nifty Bank is really outperforming. So doing much, much better in trade. Uh, one would have thought that the momentum in IT would have continued. My, my Monday saw a lot of momentum in IT. Sadly, post HCL Tech numbers and HCL Tech being down 4% and a couple of others following suit, IT is not contributing. It's having the negative impact. Mm. And that's why that index is making sure that the Nifty and the Sensex don't have the kind of move that the Nifty Bank has. So that's... Mm. Uh, the large cap momentum in the session today. Um, uh, autos, very strong numbers, and we're seeing that impact playing out in the auto names and the auto component names as well. Mm. Uh, stocks like Jamna Auto, et cetera, all of them hitting new highs for themselves. So really good going at that end of the market too. And uh, select names due to news or otherwise are doing okay. But the volatility, Harsha, in a clutch of other known names, PC Jealous, for example, I mean, you know, people spoke about the aggression that we showed in that interaction uh, on Wednesday or Thursday with the management. Uh, but, I mean, just look at what the stock has done, down another 20% today. So no matter what they are trying to do, including the buyback carrot being thrown in, uh, a large set of investors or traders out there are not convinced, and the free fall continues. 20% down, further 20% down on PC Jewelers. Neeraj, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's talk about Indigo. Market regulators said to have initiated a probe into Interglobe Aviation, a sharp uh, drop in the stock price on Friday before the company informed the exchanges about Aditya Ghosh's resignation. Uh, that's caught the attention of the market regulator. Sebi PR Sanjay joins us with more details on this one. Uh, Sanjay, thanks for joining in. What, what is Sebi's concern? So, you know, uh, Aditya Ghosh is a face for Interglobe Indigo, which is country's largest airline by passenger carry, uh, by market share, by fleet, everything. So, he's running the show. He has been successful in, uh, you know, transforming the airline from uh, uh, 18 plane to 100 plus plane. So, um, he has actually, the company has informed stock exchange that Aditya Ghosh has resigned. They have accepted the resignation on 27th. Mm. When he has, they have already accepted the resignation on 26th. Mm. So market regulator SEBI is now uh, investigating, is there any breach of insider trading norms? Mm. So if that is the case, it should be investigated. And you see uh, how the stock reacted that day. It's as if that market knew it uh, you know, much before, well in advance. So uh, resignation happens on 26th, uh, in, uh, notification comes on 27th, mm. and now SEBI is uh, after uh, uh, the company whether to check whether there's been any breach happened or not. Sanjay, thank you for that. But we're sticking with the Indigo story. Let's bring up the stock uh, on how it's trading today. That's Indigo for you. Uh, still lower about 2.5%. Meanwhile, Menaka had a chance to speak with Indigo's co-founder Rahul Bhatia. He rubbished all talks of animosity with Aditya Ghosh. He explained the circumstances surrounding Ghosh's resignation and the strategic objectives of the airline. Menka now joins us on the phone line with more on this conversation. Menka, you know, uh, the circumstances around which Aditya Ghosh's exit can best be described as, as abrupt. Uh, what did Rahul Bhatia had to say? Was he, was he defensive about this? Yeah, so Harsha, I think before I get into that, I just want to add to the conversation you were having uh, with Sanjay on the situation with regards to the stock price movement ahead of the disclosure by the company mm. that Aditya Ghosh had resigned. Uh, this is a matter that I did bring up in my conversations uh, with company officials. Uh, and this was this conversation took place yesterday. 
And uh, the indication I got was that as of yesterday, while my conversation was going on, they had received absolutely no information from the regulator on this. And that's uh, an informal conversation that I had had with them. Uh, now, the formal part of the conversation, and I put to them in response to your question and the questions that had arisen, uh, you know, regarding the circumstances around Aditya Ghosh's departure, I put to them four issues. Firstly, why this sudden departure? And here's what Rahul Bhatia told me, and I'm paraphrasing what he told me. He said it was not sudden that Aditya Ghosh had expressed a few months ago his desire to step down and devote more time to his personal life, that he was, uh, you know, close to completion of 10 years at the helm of the airline, and it had been an extremely hectic 10 years, and he wanted to be able to step back a bit. At which point I asked him if that was the case and that you knew a few months ago that Ghosh wanted to leave, then why did you allow Gregory Taylor, who had till then been serving in an almost consulting capacity uh, for almost over a year, to leave and go? Because Greg Taylor left in February, at which point the management ought to have known or the board ought to have known about Ghosh's desire to step down. And uh, Rahul Bhatia told me that we were keen on convincing Aditya. We were hopeful that we'd be able to convince him, um, but we failed in being able to do so. And that was his explanation for the gap as a result of which now Greg Taylor left the company in February 2018, that's this year, and will now return first to take charge as senior advisor, and then eventually once all the regulatory clearances are in, uh, to move on to being president and CEO, which is to fill in the shoes of Aditya Ghosh. So that was his explanation for this gap in timing. The second issue that had come up when Ghosh's resignation came in was that new executives leadership had been inducted in the company and that this could have potentially been a situation of turf wars that led to Ghosh's departure. Again, we had Rahul Bhatia debunking that. He said our expansion and executive leadership was irrespective of Ghosh's decision to stay or go, that this was necessitated by the scale and complexity of operations at this size of Indigo Airlines. Uh, he said that, you know, we've reached the size that we needed someone to take charge of daily operations. Therefore, the hire of Wolfgang Krakshore as COO. He also said that we needed to look at optimization of both network planning and revenue management. And hence, as you know, they have hired two people for both those roles, Michael Swatek and Willie Boulter, who has been hired uh, for the role of revenue management. So this was his explanation as to why they felt the need to expand the executive team. He put it down to size and complexities and scale. He said running an airline at this stage is like a hockey stick. Complexity moves up very dramatically, and therefore we needed more management anyways to be able to come on and take on some of these roles. And the reason that many of them are expatriates is because running an airline of this size is not necessarily a skill that many people in the country have. So he says, while we continue to emphasize on local management, and many of our people are Indians, including the CFO, uh, we had to look across the world for the best talent. The third issue that came up was whether there were any differences in opinion between the way Aditya Ghosh wanted to proceed uh, regarding strategic objectives of the airline and the board wanted to proceed, and namely these are two. One is an expansion of the long-haul international routes, and the second is an expansion into the hinterland of India. With regards to the long-haul international routes, he, well, actually, with regards to both, he told me, Harsha, that there was no difference in opinion between the board and the management on both of these objectives, mm. that the company intended to proceed organically to grow the international long-haul routes now that their interest in Air India had been withdrawn. As far as hinterland India is concerned, he said, look, we were always interested. We always knew there was more demand for connectivity. But at the early stages of the airline, we thought that it was best to get our main act in place and now we feel confident of being able to expand into more regional routes while maintaining cost efficiency. He also said that the ATR order, about 21 aircraft will come in by the end of this year, is not necessarily predicated only on the Uran scheme. He said, I would not bet that much money on just a government scheme uh, or a government subsidy that can be withdrawn at any point in time. This is a fundamental bet on the demand for connectivity in Hitler India, so we are betting on Hitler in India. Uh, he also emphasized that he didn't think there would be a dramatic change in the way the airline was able to maintain costs 
just because it was moving from a single aircraft fleet to a multi-aircraft fleet. Uh, he was quite emphatic about that. He said, I'm not sure uh, why that belief prevails. Uh, I think we will be able to maintain cost efficiency. Cost is the only religion at Indigo, is what he told me fairly categorically. And the fourth issue that many people have alluded to when talking about Bush's departure mm. had to do with the recent engine trouble that Indigo has faced sure. with regards to the A320neo fleet. He said, look, you can't hold Aditya responsible for engine issues. He doesn't manufacture engines. <laughs> he said these issues are being worked on. Uh, as you know, Pratt & Whitney is working to replace several of these engines so that as many aircraft can return to operations as quickly as possible. He said the core issue for why we ordered these aircraft and these engines, which was fuel efficiency, has actually delivered and delivered beyond expectations. So that's a good point. Uh, but of course, many of those aircraft were grounded, as you know, in the months of February and March, and are only slowly making it back to the skies as the engines get replaced. And he said it could take six months, a year, or even two uh, for the full problem to be resolved. Uh, as they have already said in previous earnings calls, uh, the financial losses, will be borne by the engine manufacturer, that's Pratt & Whitney, and we'll hear more detail in today's earning call uh, on exactly what the quantum of those losses is. Um, he also said that in order to make sure that we don't lose out on passenger growth because of grounded aircraft, yeah. uh, we have looked at uh, spare capacity in the market uh, for leads. Uh, so that's what he was willing to tell me ahead of the earnings call. Many operational and commercial things were obviously uh, not disclosed or discussed because it's silent period. Sure. But this was the broad strategic objective that he described and at every point in time uh, attempting to make clear that the departure of Aditya Ghosh was not sudden and was not because of any animosity as you laid out. Sure. Minka, thank you for that comprehensive sort of putting putting in context what really happened. That's Rahul Bhatia, the co-founder of uh, Indigo, on the exit of CEO Aditya Ghosh. Uh, as Minka was mentioning, today is also the numbers of the company. Interglobal uh, Aviation will declare the numbers today. Somit is standing by to tell us what the street is anticipating, where neither the engine failures nor the exit in the uh, of the CEO is likely to have any effect. Somit. So if you say Interglobe Aviation is expected to report a steady set of numbers in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018 despite engine issues which led to cancellation of more than 900 flights in the fourth quarter. Now the revenue is expected to be high around 26 percent to close to 6,100 crore rupees while EBITDA that is earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization and rental cost is expected to be high around 14 percent. However, margins are expected to contract to 25 percent while net profit is expected to be high around 8.6 percent to 478 crore rupees in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018. Now it is expected to be a steady quarter on the back of modest growth in airfare strong passenger growth and a stronger rupee. Also passenger load factor which is known as the capacity utilization averaged around 90 percent for Indigo versus 86 percent last year. Now the passenger growth that we saw in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018 was close to 24 percent while average fare is expected to be higher by 3 percent. Also a rupee averaged around 64 per dollar versus 67 per dollar last year. But some of these positives will also be offset because of the higher crude or higher aviation tur turbine fuel prices in the fourth quarter. Now ETF prices were higher around 12 percent com uh, compared to last year so that because of that we'll see some pressure on the margin side because of higher ATF prices now, the company is also expected to be compensated for the losses related to the engine issues by the engine maker that is Pratt & Whitney so that could be a surprise factor for Indigo in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018 lastly factors to watch out for would include management commentary on growth and yields also update on induction of new aircrafts and new related engine issues lastly management guidance on fuel prices and future plans on long distance international routes will be the key things to watch out for in the earnings conference call. So, with, uh, thank you for that. That's uh, the Indigo Aviation num uh, Indigo's numbers expected learning later today. But it's turning out to be a full-fledged bidding war for Fortis Healthcare. The, the stocks surge after both the Burman and Munjal combined and IHH sweetened the deal for the hospital chain. Uh, Darshan is standing by with what the latest offer on the table is. Darshan. So, two new offers coming in. First of all, let's talk about the uh, Hero Munjil offer that's come in. So, earlier they were uh, giving in 1500 crores. Uh, now they're saying they're ready to pump in almost 1800 crores. Uh, they're saying uh, without, and this 1800 crores will be put in without any kind of due diligence on the company. It will be immediate at this point of time. Uh, so, this 1800 crores is broken up in terms of 800 crores will be via a preferential issue at 167 per share, and the 1000 crores will be via warrants. Uh, and that 
that price is 176 per share. Uh, no doubt, uh, if the SEBI determined price is higher, that is the price that they will take in. What they are saying is that the upfront payment will be uh, 1050 crores because 800 crores will be the equity infusion and 25% of the 1000 crore by warrants, that is 250 crores. So, 1050 crores will be the upfront payment. And instead of two board seats, they are saying three board seats at this point of time. What they are also recommending in the path is the fact that they want to divest the stake in SRL because they want to focus on the hospital business and this money will be used to fund the RSG transaction. If this doesn't go through, they will come out with the rights issue to, uh, to fund the transaction. The next offer comes from IHH in which they have said that, you know, instead of 160, valuing the company at 160 rupees per share, they are valuing the company at 175 rupees per share. But this time around, they want a due diligence for the company. So two more offer coming in and Manipal has uh, the time till 6th of May to decide for the offer. So it will be interesting to see what Manipal does now. Darshan, thank you for that. Let's talk about HCL Tech. HCL Tech is the top Nifty loser today. Despite the company meeting street expectations in the fourth quarter, what's gotten investors worried is the fiscal 19 guidance, uh, which when new acquisitions are left out has failed to impress. Agam is at the uh, HCL Technology headquarters, joins us with the fine print of what, uh, what the company did today. Uh, Agam. Well, it's been another steady quarter for HCL Technology, starting off with revenues, which move up is by as much as 2.9% on a sequential basis. We've also seen EBIT rise 2.9% and net income up as much as 1.5%. And all the three headline numbers are in line with Bloomberg consensus expectations. Among the key watchables for this quarter was the FY19 guidance. And we have a guidance of around 9.5 to 11.5% in constant currency terms. That's the revenue growth for FY19. 19 again in line with what we were expecting when it comes to margins guidance that stands at around 19.5 to 20.5 percent and as per the management there shouldn't really be a, too many challenges with respect to maintaining their margins as far as this financial year is concerned in terms of key geographies we have seen americas which has declined by as much as 0.7 percent sequentially europe on the other hand in line with some of its peers has seen a growth of as much as 3.6 percent in terms of its services, the infrastructure management services has seen a 2.5% growth on a sequential basis and financial services has seen an uptake of as much as 2.0%. That said, on the whole, it's been a good quarter for HCL Technologies, largely in line with street expectations. Thanks, Agam. Well, Agam also spoke to the CEO of the company, C. Vijay Kumar, and he sounded confident of the company's growth trajectory. Listen into a slice of that chat. So we've given a guidance range which is 9.5 and between 9.5 and 11.5 uh, i think uh, uh, we are we remain confident of our growth trajectory due to uh, various uh, positive trends uh, right. the first being our mode 2 and mode 3 offerings are becoming very compelling and they're seeing an upward trajectory where both in terms of number of deals and size of deals uh, we've also completed our verticalized go-to-market strategy for IT services globally, uh, which is helping us to drive more business outcome-led uh, propositions and solutions to right. our clients. And you've seen a good uh, leadership in our uh, growth leadership in our financial services, manufacturing, and we continue to look at uh, strategic partnerships and acquisitions as well as a part of our uh, growth strategy. So all of that gives us confidence. Uh, at this point, we believe uh, we'll be in the guidance of 9.5 and 11.5%. And right. You know, there has been some slackness in organic growth. And, of course, we've all noticed that a, a bulk of your growth now comes through acquisitions. Is that is also going to be the case? And what can we expect from organic growth? Then? I think, uh, I mean, as we had said earlier, uh, whether it is FY18 or in FY19, I think our growth is balanced between organic and inorganic. And as I see in FY19, I expect it to be uh, more or less equal in organic and inorganic terms. Uh, we do believe this is a great opportunity to invest and scale our business. And uh, that's a strategy we are pursuing. Thank okay, you. and uh, one final question before I let you go is a question on uh, the banking financial services space. We're still really not getting as much clarity, and I've spoken to a lot of your peers as well. There is still a lack of visibility, should I say, uh, in as far as this vertical is concerned. What can you tell us about that? See, financial services, uh, we've really done very well. Right. I think uh, we grew uh, close to 16% uh, uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. Mm -hmm. So we have significant momentum, and this is really driven by uh, the strength of our digital offering. 
Yeah. Right? We've opened up a number of new accounts where we didn't have a presence just with the help of our uh, sharpness and the differentiated digital proposition. So I think I remain positive even in FY19, uh, financial services uh, will continue to do well. That's the management of HCL Tech. Let's talk about banking now. What's been touted as Indian Bank's final push for NPA recognition will continue to hurt profitability for a few quarters to come. That's according to Moody, Moody's Investor Services. The rating agency, however, believes that cleaner balance sheet in the long run to be credit positive for the sector. To understand uh, Moody's views on the banking sector in greater detail, let's welcome in Alka Anbaras, Vice President of Institutional Financial Institutions Group at Moody's Investor Services. Uh, Alka, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, let me begin this conversation by asking you, you know, what's the basis of your confidence? Are you saying that this, this is a, the, the hurt in profitability is short term in nature and the cleanup will yield benef benefits in the long term? Sure. So uh, some of the messages that we are saying is that NPL recognition uh, is coming to an end. So this uh, February circular from RBI will push up NPL recognition over the next, uh, next few quarters. But this would mean that provisioning costs will remain high for the banking system and asset credit costs will remain high in the next next year or so. But, but to your question, what gives us con confidence that we are coming to an end is, uh, is some of the analysis that we have done and we have looked into the, the potential stressed asset and, and we think that these are not new problems of the banking system. These are problems that, are, that were well known uh, from the same legacy book of assets originated between 2009 to 12, which has caused the bulk of the asset quality challenges for the system, relate to the similar stress factors, whether it's infrastructure, power, steel, and assets, these are not new problems. And to a large extent, we were always taking those into account in our stressed assets ratio. So the problem is not new, but, but this would mean that profitability for the banking system will remain under pressure in the next year. Okay. Uh, I, let me just push this point a little further. I, you, I agree, the problem is not new. Sectors like infrastructure, power are, are well-known uh, problem areas. Uh, but do you see, whatever you're seeing with the NCLT process, the, the IBC process, is it reaching a logical conclusion where assets are getting sold off uh, for you to feel positive that this is going to meet its deadline? Sure. So, so indeed, on the NCLT process, uh, there was a positive momentum when we heard about those uh, those steel assets and uh, at least the initial um, news that we are also hearing is that the loss given default or the haircuts the banks need to take are much lower than what they have been providing for those assets so perhaps on the steel front there, there is there is some some uh, positive news but obviously the legal processes are are still unknown and this whole nclt process is something new so we need to see if those resolutions finally see the conclusion and then we move on from those assets. So that, that, that's one part of the problem where steel has been a positive um, surprise or pos at least, a, at least some, some amount of good news. But, but now the bulk of the challenges is relating to the other infrastructure segments. So whether it's construction, power, where actually we don't know how the haircuts uh, will turn out to be. And the expectation is that the haircuts could be worse than where we see the steel uh, resolutions come out. And that could, that could cause uh, some issues for the banking system. Uh, a specific point that you make about uh, government-owned banks, you said increased provisioning will obviously hurt uh, government-owned banks. That, that's likely to get offset by the planned capital infusion by the government. Uh, but, you know, hasn't there always been a yawning gap between the capital that is required and what the government has allotted so far? And again, the second piece to this problem is that quarter after quarter, you're actually seeing, uh, you know, the, the declared assets was the real ones, what has now be popularly become called divergence, only increasing. So, so uh, one, uh, we think the quantum of capital infusion that the government announced last year was quite comprehensive and the government made commitments that all banks will achieve the minimum Basel III uh, norms. And, and this is after assuming that the banking system will provide for the NPS, perhaps not, uh, uh, will reach at least a provision cover of 50-55% or so in the, in the next year. So, so from that perspective, uh, the, the next part that is yet to come uh, should broadly address the issues, at least of the weakest uh, public sector banks. But clearly the pot is, 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 is well defined, what, what capital the government will infuse, and, and clearly the asset quality challenges uh, are, are still continuing. Uh, but, but this could have uh, one implication, at least we think that 
uh, while the government is very much committed that all banks would meet the, the minimum Basel three norms, which is 8% CET one ratio by March 2019, but in this process of doing so, perhaps some of the stronger banks could lose out. So some of the stronger banks uh, could get less capital from the government, which was already evidence in the capital infusion the government did in January. And some of the stronger banks would need to go out and raise capital by themselves, whereas the weaker banks that don't have access to the capital markets would, would get uh, support from the government. Would you continue to view private sector banks a little more favorably as the street has always but you know had this distinction between public and private sector banks uh, would you consider to view them favorably uh, so, so among the private sector banks uh, I think it, it's obviously well known that ICICI and Axis Bank have bulk of this asset quality challenges they are the big corporate lenders uh, as well and and we don't think that their asset quality profile is is going to be significantly different than the public sector banks but their ability to absorb this impact is much higher because their operating profits are better. So as such, their ability to absorb credit costs is, is much better. Their provision coverage, coverage ratios are already somewhat better than most of the public sector banks. And, be, and then their capitalization profile is already better. So from that perspective, indeed, the private sector banks have better wherewithal to, to go through this, uh, this uh, initial issue. But, but clearly, the ultimate impact will depend on how these resolutions take place, what kind of haircuts banks need to take on, their, on, on the assets, and, and where do we end up with the balance sheets, perhaps in the next 12 to 18 months or so. Alka, we leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us with your views. Alka Anbarasu from Moody's Investor Services talking about uh, the NPA issue in the banking sector and how this might be this might be the beginning of a you know a cleaning process might end up beneficial to the banking sector in the long run. Uh, so put a break on that note. On the other side, JP Morgan, Jahangir Razis talks about some of the old problems that are facing the Indian economy and some new ones on the other side. Sorry, I'm late. Kya hua? Kuch nahi yaar. Just working on my expansion plan. Uh, funding ka chakkar. Hmm. It is so frustrating. I feel like banging my head against the wall. No, no, don't bang your head. Cross the bridge instead. Bridge? Huh? Ye dek. La. Are... This bridge gets you in touch with interested investors. Funding happens, which means more outlets, more customers. Interesting. And what exactly is this bridge? A stock exchange created for your kind of company. Just list on it and help your business expand. Really? Yeah. So then list it. And what? Who was the first time? Let's go. NSC March. Saath Hamara. Safalta Aapki. The SME Growth Platform from India's largest stock exchange. White shirts. Kitane plain or simple. Fox scent. Plain or simple white shirt ko bana de special or fashionable. Fox scent. New fashion wear for men. What if lucky discoveries could be discovered without luck? What if the secret code to investing was no longer secret? Could the complexities of business not be so complex anymore? Decode. Demystify. Learn. BQ Learning. Only on Bloomberg Quint. on Pa Lunch on Bloomberg Queen headlines at this hour. Market straight flat as market breadth remains equally divided. India VIX rises. Automakers cruise through April as all listed players report double-digit sales growth last month. Facebook introduces a clear history option at the F8 workshop. Quick check on how the markets are faring. It's continuing to be a day of, day of consolidation for the markets. The Nifty is trading at about half a percent higher in the green, 145 points up on the Sensex. 
Bank Nifty has been leading the pack today, particularly the leading banks are taking charge. HDFC Bank is up about a percent, percent and a half. HDFC about a percent up. State Bank of India is also trading in the green. That's leading the momentum of the market up. However, volatility is not too far behind. You're seeing rise, the, uh, rise in the VIX, India VIX once again to give you a sense of how volatile, how the, the pressures and pulls and pressures are facing the market at this juncture. But it is where it is in the last 20 minutes. Uh, so we leave the, market, leave the markets here for now and focus on what's happening in the automobile space. It may be a new financial year, but that hasn't stopped automakers from posting healthy growth figures last month, be it uh, car purchases, two-wheeler or commercial vehicle manufacturers. They've all cruised through in April. Yatin is standing by to take us through some of those numbers. Yatin. Thanks for that, Harsha. And if you look at uh, the auto sales for the month of April, they have been quite healthy. Uh, barring, uh, you know, one or two companies, uh, most of them have reported healthy growth numbers and uh, the numbers have been much above the street expectations. Now, starting with Maruti Suzuki, uh, they posted a 14% growth in the domestic sales and, uh, of course, the export markets remain buoyant for the automaker. Uh, that is the reason why the total sales growth was nearly 14.5% on a year-on-year -year basis. Similar is the case with Tata Motors. Total, uh, you know, sales uh, growth was much above the street expectations and if you look at the reasons, we had a three times uh, growth uh, in the commercial vehicle sales. Uh, the passenger vehicle sales uh, was up 34% and domestic sales uh, growth for Tata Motors was a uh, whopping 86%. Uh, M&M, uh, the passenger vehicle segment uh, sales growth was 13%, overall uh, growth was 22%. Uh, similar was the case with Escorts, uh, wherein the agri-equipment uh, segment uh, domestic sales were up 28%. Uh, Aisha Motors also, if you look at the Royal Enfield uh, end of the uh, market for them, a 27% growth was seen there. Uh, TVS Motors, uh, again a strong growth, domestic market growth was 18%, uh, overall uh, export market growth was 53%, uh, total growth coming in 22% for uh, the auto major. Uh, Bajaj Auto also uh, posted a very strong set of uh, numbers uh, wherein uh, the domestic market uh, sales was on the positive side. What disappointed was Ashok Leland's uh, sales number. Uh, came in uh, below the street expectations. Uh, we were expecting, uh, you know, uh, the growth to be nearly doubling, uh, you know, on a year-on-year -year basis. However, uh, they posted a slightly weaker set of uh, numbers, uh, post which the stock uh, saw some, you know, 3% uh, decline on an intraday basis. Uh, but uh, clearly, at this point in time, the overall numbers seems to be healthy, uh, given the fact that uh, we had a strong month of March, and despite that, uh, we had a good month of April f as well for the auto companies. We're also looking for Hero. What's the market pricing in for Hero, Yatin? Well, if you look at uh, Hero Motor Corp, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you uh, were to take uh, the, uh, the fourth quarter estimates, uh, they were, uh, you know, uh, quite strong. Uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, you know, overall uh, numbers for uh, Hero Motor Corp, uh, we are expecting a healthy growth there. Uh, if you look at the, you know, uh, margin picture, we could see a good e expansion there, uh, given the fact that the volume growth was, uh, you know, uh, quite stronger since, uh, you know, uh, uh, March and if you look at uh, the uh, uh, profit number, uh, that is uh, seen uh, almost 33% higher on a year-on-year -year basis. Profit seen at uh, 958 crores. Of course, the key factors to watch out for, apart from the earnings, will be the management commentary on the rural markets. Uh, since the past few months, we have seen good traction in the rural markets, uh, and you know the outlook in FY19 is something important that we'll be watching out for for this particular segment. And uh, you know, finally, the uh, new launches and uh, the expansion plans in the uh, African and the South American markets is something important we'll be watching out for apart from the earnings. Rajan, thank you for that. That's the automobile sector. LNT, meanwhile, will sell its electrical and auto automation business to Schneider. The 14,000 crore deal leaves out marine switchgear and servo, servo watch systems. Uh, LNT has been planning this for quite some time now. Uh, Purva caught up with Essence Subramanian, MD and CEO of LNT, to understand what's been causing the delay in this deal. Listen in. So when you do a business transaction of this size, we have manufacturing facilities at Coimbatore, at Ahmednagar, at uh, Baroda, at, at Mape, at Bombay and all that. Uh, there is a lot of due diligence and, and detailing that has gone through. And uh, many of these multinational companies are, uh, have, have good processes and systems which need that. We also have good processes and systems which require that. And that due diligence and process does take time. And uh, in my view, one year is a fairly good time in which you've done this transaction. And uh, having said that, I think uh, it's, 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 it's a good negotiation. So all aspects have been thought through, have been, have, been, have been fought through, have been argued about, have been settled, and therefore it's a good deal to have. The valuation is, uh, of course, 14,000 crores. So how would you be using this, these funds? The, 
Valuation is based, as I said, on many aspects. It's just not a multiple of EBITDA here, but it's also the, the spread of the business, the, uh, the, the distribution channels, the, the channel partners, the, the presence in various countries, the pre-qualification uh, documents that are available with us. You can bid anywhere because we are pre-qualified everywhere. The, the approval of the business by many, many, many industrials and, and, and bodies. The, the, the tooling centers, the, the design center, uh, the, the set of people that we have who run the business, these are invaluable in my view. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, that's the result of the valuation. Now, let the deal go through in totality. Uh, let's receive the money. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as an organization, we also think through a lot on what to do and how to go about it. And we will, at the appropriate time, tell you how we're using the 14,000 crores to further benefit the organization and the shareholders at large. But will you be like still, uh, you know, keep um, taking this for some of the money, probably in some other verticals, maybe? The money comes into the overall balance sheet of the company. So it is available for uh, the businesses that are present within the company. And we'll use it with uh, great uh, prudence and, and conservativeness that LNT is known for. All right. And uh, I also want to understand here, like, what was the rationale behind keeping the uh, marine switch care and server watch uh, business as as is? Like, the marine switch gear and server watch are relatively very minor part of this uh, entire business of EIC. The marine switch gear was basically to do deal with the supplying certain electrical situations into into the naval systems predominantly, and these are part of the defence. Our defense showed some interest in that because it's had some synergy with whatever they are doing. It's the largest private sector defense player within the country. And Schneider was also not extremely keen to have it because this is spread out on various ships and various docks and to go and replace everything and to maintain it is a, is a, is a, is a process by itself. And when we said we would like to keep it, they said fine with it and that's how it was kept uh, with, our, with LNT and that would be housed within our defense uh, business. That's the CEO and MD of uh, Larson Tubro. HGFC, meanwhile, reported a 40% growth in its net profit uh, for the March quarter. Vice Chairman and CEO KK Mistri says there's good demand for housing finance, especially with the government's affordable housing push. Listen in. There's a structural demand for housing, which is driving and creating more people to buy houses. Uh, there are several reasons why the demand for housing is strong. First is housing in India has become a lot more affordable compared to what it used to be in the past. And when we talk of affordable, we are talking of, we are not talking the stock bumps in central Mumbai or south Mumbai or mm -hmm. Delhi or Bangalore, any of the big cities. But in the outskirts of the cities or in tier two, tier three towns, right. housing is very affordable. Secondly, the penetration level of mortgages in India is extremely low at 9% of GDP. If you compare that with Western countries, US is 63%, UK 68%, even closer home, China is 22%, India is only 9%. So we have such a low penetration of housing, housing finance. The third is, and according to me, what is causing the large part of the growth now, is this huge focus by the government on affordable housing. And the government's done what it could to encourage more people to buy houses. There are fiscal benefits associated with a housing loan. The interest on a housing loan is tax exempt to the extent of 2 lakhs of rupees. Mm. The principal repayment of a housing loan qualifies as a saving, and along with other revenues of saving, gets a deduction of up to a lakh and 50,000 rupees. So both interest and principal can be reduced from the taxable income of an individual. KK Mystery of HTFC. Rising oil prices and weakening currency are prompting some economists to change their mind on the rate trajectory of the Reserve Bank of India. Two foreign lenders are among those who think that the central bank may hike rates as soon as August this year. Anirban of uh, Anirban Nag of Bloomberg News, who's been speaking to some of them, joins us with more details. Uh, what's the thinking and why this change in mind? Well, um, Harsha, the, the reason why both Deutsche as well as uh, DBS are raising is because of the rupee. The rupee has come under pressure because oil prices have risen. Now, um, uh, what, what, what this does is that the markets are already pricing in uh, about 50 basis points of rate hikes. But the economists are a bit more cautious mm. given that the economy is still in, an, it's, it's in a nascent recovery. Now, what, what Deutsche is saying is that because of the crude oil price hike, they are expecting the rate cycle to come forward and they're expecting a rate hike as soon as June. Mm. Now, the reason why they, why, why Kaushik Das, the chief economist in Deutsche, thinks that is it's, going to, it's a preemptive um, uh, strike in June will actually help the RBS credibility as a 
in inflation targeting central banker mm -hmm. and actually um, help stabilize the macroeconomic forces that are uh, playing out in the economy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Well, that's, that's the story for you. Uh, two foreign banks have actually do, do believe that the rate cycle will perhaps begin a lot earlier than anticipated. A stressed banking system is acting as a constraint to India's growth story. That's a view from J.P. Morgan's Jahangir Aziz. Speaking to Ira, he, as, Aziz said that the U.S. Treasury yields may take a pause at 3.25 percent, while India's current account deficit will only widen from here on. Listen it. I think there's a repricing that is taking place where the market had been behind the curve in terms of, uh, you know, what the Fed was signaling for a very long time. Uh, I think the market is now getting to a point where it's starting to believe uh, what the Fed is talking about, you know, three rate hikes in 2018 and, three more, and two more in 2019. Uh, we in JP Morgan have a higher uh, set of you know, uh, rate hikes, both for 2018 and 19. Um, uh, but I think you know the reaction that you're seeing in the market, both in the 10-year as well as in the U.S. dollar strength, is simply that you know, the market is basically moving up closer to the dots and what it implies for the dollar, rather than this being driven by something that's happening fundamentally to the global economy, to the EMDM growth dynamics, or uh, in in terms of, you know, surprises on the inflation front. You are expecting a JP Morgan Jangir, uh, say, yields uh, upwards of uh, uh, the 3% mark or a dollar, which is much stronger than it has been over the past year? No, so we are expecting the U.S. Treasury to end somewhere close to 325 for 2018. However, uh, we think that with 325, given the growth dynamics, particularly between U.S. and Euro area, and given you know what are the drivers of uh, you know U.S. Gro U.S. growth at this point in time, which is almost like one and a half, two percentage points of higher uh, fiscal deficit, accompanied by one 1.2 percentage points of higher current account deficit, even with the increase in the U.S. Treasury rates closer to 3.25, we would continue to see a benign or a weakening dollar against the euro. So uh, in that scenario, uh, does an economy like India take a you know, potentially lesser hit than a you know, scenario where we had higher yields and a stronger dollar? Uh, because I think uh, you know, that, has been, that combination has been what has been worrying domestic markets a bit. Right. So I think there are two uh, separate issues over here. There is the global emerging market, de developed market uh, trends, and then there is the India-specific factors. So if you look at the global emerging market DM trend, uh, the biggest driver of uh, flows into emerging market has always been uh, the growth gap between emerging markets and developed markets. And that we expect to see uh, widening in favor of emerging markets throughout 2018 and 19. Uh, interest rate differential actually matter much less. What really matters is dollar strength or dollar weakness. Uh, so in an, in an environment in which we see EMDM growth differentials favoring emerging markets as well as a dollar remaining benign or remaining pretty soft against the euro, we do expect for emerging market flows to remain strong. There will be episodes, as we have seen over the last two weeks, where there is uh, there's increased volatility because the market is repricing to it. But once it goes back uh, to the fundamental drivers, we do expect emerging market flows to continue. But then there is the India factors. So as far as the India macroeconomics is concerned, there are again you know, two basic drivers of Indian macroeconomics right now. Fundamentally, the fiscal deficit is widening. And along with that, the current account deficit is widening. And the current account deficit is widening not just because oil prices are higher, that is adding to it, but fundamentally because uh, savings in India is falling short of investment, largely because the government is actually just saving much more. In such an environment, you do expect rates to be higher and the currency to be weaker. And that's essentially what India is facing. Now, you know, you can try, as the government has done and as the RBI has done, put band-aids to it, you know, by extending forbearance, uh, by playing around with the issuance, uh, easing a bit on the side, uh, as they did last Friday, uh, the, uh, the, the restrictions on foreign investment flows. But fundamentally, you, India will be facing these pressures because the macroeconomics has changed in 2018-19 as opposed to what we have seen in 2016 and 17. 
on that point on uh, what they what the RBI did on Friday, Jangir, what did you make of that? I mean, you know, it was the short end of the curve that got us uh, in the 2013-14 period when the taper tantrum started. Not to say that our you know economics are back right. at what we were in 2013, but it seemed like a slightly reactive policy. Or do you think there is some merit in uh, you know easing up these restrictions on FPI flows on the debt market? Again, you know, there are two separate issues over here. The first issue is that whether or not India, over a, a as a strategic uh, decision, should it allow more uh, foreign investments into government securities, i.e., should it add to the demand or add new demand to government bonds? And if you look at most emerging market countries, most emerging market market countries have increased the amount of foreign investment flows into uh, the local bond market. Uh, including in China, which was sort of the, you know, the India-like uh, behavior, which is that they would open up everything except for the bond market. But if you look at what China is doing over the last six to nine months, it has opened up the bond market significantly. And almost all other large emerging market countries have no restrictions of foreigners into the bond market. And the sky hasn't fallen down on the heads of these emerging market economies. So that's the strategic view. And I think in, along with that lines, there should be increased openings of foreign direct and in, of foreign investments into the bond market. Apart from increasing the demand or adding to the demand for Indian bonds, it also adds, and this is the crucial factor, it also adds a little bit more market discipline on the Indian government in terms of what they can do in fiscal policy and not. Because as far as the Indian markets is concerned, uh, you know, taking an action against, given the capital controls, it's very difficult to actually stay away from Indian bonds, even if the fiscal deficit is going to widen. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is what you want to do in the short term. In the short term, I think, you know, Reserve Bank of India and the government of India has always had this problem of actually uh, conflict, conflating two things, which is short term instruments with short term investors. If you look at the depth of the 10-year market, then you know I can always be a very, very short-term investor, even in a 10-year in a 10-year instrument. So restricting the restricting the duration of the instrument didn't really ever make any make any sense because there are a large number of very long-term repeated investors in India who like to prefer to be in the short end of the bond. So a short end of the tenor. So I'm glad that the that the that the RBI has lifted that restriction because it doesn't really make much of a sense. To your more bigger question, you know, uh, does this imply greater volatility? Uh, you know, all depends on the macro on the macroeconomics and how RBI and the government plays with the macroeconomics. If they, if they maintain macroeconomic stability, like any other emerging market country, it will continue to attract foreign investments into the bond market. If it doesn't, then, then, then people will leave. So it's, it's much more to do with macroeconomic stability and macroeconomic policy than whether or not you're allowing people in the short end or in the long end. Are there risks on the horizon for macroeconomic uh, stability, Jahangir, to your view? Well, look. Well, look, you know, as I said, you know, the, 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 for India, the fundamental changes on the macroeconomics are two things. One is that we are facing uh, a much higher current account of, uh, fiscal, fiscal deficit this year uh, than in the past. In the past, if you look at state and government uh, fiscal deficit, uh, they had broadly been kept around 7%, uh, 6.5%, 7% of GDP. This is a year in which you are likely to see the 7% of GDP being breached and how much it get, uh, gets, gets breached, uh, it's anyone's question, but it could be very much closer to 8% than 7% this year, given what's happening to the state and given what's happened to the government's, central government's own fiscal uh, budget, budgetary plans. And let, let's add to it the fact that this is also an election year. Uh, the the other side of it is that you know in 2016 and 17 uh, the current account was kept very very low and I think that was the biggest you know uh, support to macroeconomic stability this time around current account deficit is going to widen with and without the oil prices with the with high oil prices is going to be even worse we are looking at somewhere close to two and a half three percent of GDP which is a far cry from what it used to be you know last year or the year before that where it was closer to one one and a half percent of GDP so if you're 
facing fundamental shifts in the macroeconomic stability, you are going to continue to face pressures both on the interest rate front as well as downward pressures on the rupee. So I think this is what is different in 2018-19 as opposed to what it used to be the case in 2016-17. And on inflation, Jangir, uh, Michael Patra is of the belief that we are behind the curve, just looking at the way bond markets have moved. I think Vilal Acharya is moving in that direction as well, voting for a rate hike. Uh, do you see risks on inflation? Uh uh, look, no, you know, there are two parts to the inflation uh, story. One is, of course, you know, what happens to food. And there you have been, uh, India has benefited from better food, food management and food inflation has actually surprised on the downside. But then you have the MSP increases coming up. Uh, and, you know, it is, it, it is unclear how much the MSP increase will be. Uh, clearly, if there is a reasonably large MSP increase, 50 percent of cost, depending upon what formula they follow, uh, there could be an increase in food inflation going forward. Uh, core inflation, on the other hand, which is probably what uh, members of the MPC pay more attention to, that has been stubbornly high around that four and a half, five percent range for a very long period of time. Uh, and this is not the first time that members of the MPC has warned about India being behind the curve. Uh, you know, this is probably the second, uh, I mean, second review in which uh, members of the MPC have uh, made uh, have made that argument. Uh, this time around there have been many more MPC members who are making the argument. The problem, I think, with the Reserve Bank of India is not that, you know, that the inflation is, is moving up, etc. I think the Reserve Bank of India right now is back to this problem of trying to balance its multiple objectives. So if you go back to, you know, what the Reserve Bank of India actually does, there is inflation targeting. There is, it is also the, uh, you know, the, the, the debt manager of, of, of the government, as well as the keeper of financial stability. And these three objectives in you know, normal times are fine. They don't come into conflict. But there are certain times when these three objectives come into conflict. And this is something that has been warned by the previous governor, uh, Governor Subbara. He talked about the trilemma facing Reserve Bank of India. By the Sri Krishna committee report was very, very detailed and explicit about these three different objectives come into conflict. And there needs to be a separation of these three objectives. That hasn't happened. Right now, it is very difficult to figure out what is it that the RBI is targeting. Is it targeting the inflation rate? Is it targeting the 10-year rate? Or is it targeting financial stability by making sure that, you know, at least the public sector bank's capital remains more or less preserved because of the extension of forbearance that is doing at the same time? Uh, so, you know, this is a this is when those three multiple objectives have come into conflict. And again, you know, uh, I'm looking at the uh, monetary policy review, looking at the minutes, looking at the action, the 10-year rate, uh, or, or, or as a debt manager, what the Reserve Bank is doing, looking at what they're doing on the regulatory front. And it's very difficult to figure out what is it at this point in time that monetary policy is targeting. Uh, great point, Jangir. I have time for one last question, and I want to slip in one on uh, the banking issues. I think you've spoken a sure. number of times we've spoken in the past. You've said we have to fix this banking issue. The banking issue is sure. still not fixed. Uh, someone the other day said to me that, you know, policymakers no. seem fairly clueless on how to, uh, how to even start fixing the issues. Uh, what is your thought on the whole banking problem and the interplay with the economy? Uh, look, you know, again, you know, we have, we have, we have, we have sort of you know, spoken about this a number of times. Uh, this is not a new issue. It's, we were flagging it back in 2013 14 that th there would be a time when this would become the binding constraint to India, uh, India's growth. Uh, it has been the case for the last two years. Uh, I think the government is, or the RBI both together, are trying to solve too many problems at the same time. You know, there is a moral hazard issue. Should we go and recapitalize public sector banks once again? Because this is only going to encourage them to take you know, uh, bad, bad, bad actions later on. So let me try and make sure that a risk management system is put into place uh, along with the capital that is injecting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there is no real clarity. Or I would say there's no, no, no real clarity. There is clarity. They want to fix all the problems of the banking sector at the same time. However, there is no urgency. 
that is the issue that I have with the government's and the RBI's program, that they seem to think that they have time in their hands. Uh, they seem to think that letting, uh, you know, all of the processes that they have put into place, and not just this uh, particular uh, leadership in the RBI, even the previous leadership, uh, all of that is going to take a very long time to actually get fixed. In the, in the meanwhile, uh, the, you know, the public sector banks and the banking sector problems continue to fester. And I think that this idea that they have time, I think that most likely will be increasingly challenged as we go into 2018 and 19. Jahangir Aziz from JP Morgan. Finally, Facebook has unveiled a new privacy control uh, called Clear History, which allows users to delete their past history on the social networking site. Mark Zuckerberg made this announcement at the ongoing workshop by accepting that he didn't have clear enough answers on data control while he was testifying before the Congress. Out of time on this edition of Power Lunch. Thank you for watching. Up next is Countdown.